Thank you. We'd like to welcome you to this very special event. I have uh, three very short announcements that I think will be of interest to many of you. Uh, for those of you who are uh, interested in pursuing uh, the ideas of the Arnold Jacobs approach a little bit more, tomorrow afternoon, Thursday, from 5 to 6, um, Dr. Sheldon Kirshner, who is a very good friend of Mr. Jacobs and a psychologist and lawyer and horn player from Chicago, will be uh, presenting a discussion on the psychological perspective of the Arnold Jacobs method. And that will be Thursday from 5 to 6 in this building, room 301. And I think that should be fascinating. Mr. Jacobs will be there as well. For those of you who are students or former students of Mr. Jacobs, um, we are going to, this evening, from 4 to 6, we're going to meet with Arnold Jacobs in the Radio TV building, which is north. It's just north of the IU Auditorium where the gala concerts were held, um, north of 7th Street. It's just a five-minute, six-minute walk. Uh, a little hard to find. You may have to ask questions, but we're going to meet in Studio 6, Studio 6 of the Radio TV building. Uh, all students and former students of him are invited, and we're going to just have a discussion with Mr. Jacobs. Uh, it will be videotaped and uh, should be extremely interesting, uh, and we hope that any of you, uh, are, you we are all, all students are invited to attend. I think it will be very, very exciting. There are um, just a few people that I haven't been able to contact uh, that I would like to meet, have meet me just at the north lobby immediately after this session today at noon. Um, one is uh, Bob Karen, Marvin Perry, Bill Robinson from Waco, Texas, the horn player, uh, Lou Soloff, and Dan Parentoni. If you would meet me just outside the lobby, uh, just outside those doors immediately following uh, Mr. Jacobs' presentation, I would appreciate it. And now I uh, take great pleasure in introducing to you the person who will present the IBC, the International Brass Congress II Award to Arnold Jacobs. The person we chose to make this presentation, it was a very obvious choice for many reasons. Um, a couple of them are the fact that he has uh, shared the stage with Arnold Jacobs for many, many years. Uh, thousands of performances, I'm sure. He's uh, sat immediately in front of Mr. Jacobs and uh, certainly knows the situation from the inside out. He is uh, certainly recognized throughout the world as a teacher, performer, and author without peer. And I would like to now introduce to you Mr. Philip Farkas. I've been invited to say a few words about my dear friend Arnold Jacobs. I can't think of a finer honor or a pleasanter duty than, than to have this opportunity to say something about Arnold. I think in my own case, I consider the number 13 to be my lucky number because I sat in front of Arnold for 13 years, my last 13 years in the Chicago Symphony. I sat directly in front of Arnold Jacobs. And that is quite a treat. <clears throat> I, I think we averaged 175 concerts a year. And for 13 years, that comes to some 2,200 concerts. Uh, that is the greatest music lesson you can have, is to sit in front of Arnold Jacobs for 2,200 concerts. <clears throat> uh, you, uh, you could not help but hear how an attack is made on a brass instrument sitting that close. What is good phrasing? Uh, what is ideal intonation. All these things were demonstrated to us, <clears throat> although I've never really uh, had formal lessons with Arnold. I consider myself a pupil of Arnold's because of having sat so close to him and absorbing these, these wonderful concepts of his. I did have one short lesson with him. <clears throat> I was having one of my annual slumps, semi-annual slumps, and uh, <laughs> And I went up uh, to Arnold. I said, 
I don't know, what am I doing wrong? So is everything going badly right now? And he said, well, he said, I've been listening to you for years. He says, there's nothing wrong with you. He says, you're, you're starting to analyze yourself too much. He said, do me a favor. He said, shut your eyes, turn off your brain, and blow the damn thing. <laughs> I, I tried that, and it worked perfectly. That, that, was, that was the answer. <clears throat> that was a simplified lesson. But, uh, of course, Arnold's biggest ability was to uh, take a student and in, in one hour's time zero in on what the real trouble was and not only zero in on it, but uh, decide what the cure was, the remedy. And I don't know of anyone who could do that quicker and more correctly than Arnold Jacobs. Uh, so I would uh, like to have Arnold come out here now and let me introduce him personally. Arnold? The International Brass Congress wants to honor Arnold with this plaque, and I don't know of anyone in the world who deserves it more, and I'd like to read what it says. Uh, International Brass Congress, June 3rd to 8th, 1984, in appreciation and recognition of the unique and profound contribution over the last 50 years through musical excellence, continuing inspiration to all brass players, and a lifetime dedication to artistic tuba performance, the International Brass Congress presents this award to Arnold Jacobs. I just wish that uh, it were solid gold and twice the size, but this is for you, Arnold. some years to come. I had to I had a cancerous condition uh, develop about two years ago and just recently uh, within the last few weeks I was hospitalized and there was just no trace of it. There, the, I wanted to have a champagne celebration in my hospital room, but the doctors and nurses, while they were all for it, just wouldn't allow it. It was right after surgery, but the news was so good, and I felt so good about it, and I'm still celebrating even now. And <laughs> so if it keeps coming in this way, I don't know how I'll stand it. But uh, I think I should mention a few things as long as I was brought here to uh, discuss uh, a little bit of the um, aspect of playing in a musical instrument and uh, it can be in orchestral or solo work or whatsoever. But I prefer to kind of talk about the people who play these instruments 
And uh, I think so many answers lie in the study of the human being and how they apply themselves to various functions in life, whether it's athletics, dancing, or whether they use their body for so many things. To do this, we have to go into sort of a study of analogous situations. And uh, I like to think in terms of the differences between certain friends of mine, uh, the work that they do, and um, well, Dr. Sheldon here is also a lawyer. There's, um, he's a French horn player and a psychologist and a lawyer. There's three occupations that um, I suppose there are many elements of similarity in the use of the brain and function because these are occupations that require a great deal of concentration and thought. I have friends of mine who are artists who build things. They build with their hands. They are cabinet makers or tool and die makers. I have people that in all walks of life that I've had associations with over the years. And I often think about what must be the differences in, you know, the art form that I'm in and uh, we'll say, um, oh, a person um, who is in construction work has to design an architecture and so forth. The human brain is a magnificent tool. Those of you who are at the um, pedagogy uh, uh, workshop on Monday I will note that I started talking about this and I thought I might pursue this a little further and try to clarify my concepts of this because I do think it's so important. I could sit and play for you but it wouldn't be very good because uh, of uh, anemia following surgery and this and that and uh, I can still play. I'm still a member of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra and I'm improving daily and if we have time I'll do a little playing. But I think there's more to offer for young people and those of you who are teachers by trying to understand a little more about your self and the way we approach the uh, phenomena of music as an art form. If you study machine systems, if you study the structure of an automobile, you find an enormously complex mechanism that's put together by people in the manufacturing business. They put together nuts and bolts and pistons and all sorts of parts that are very complex and um, but when they're through assembling the complexity of the car, they always put in a control panel in the driver's compartment. So the driver communicates to extremely complex machinery through very simple controls, leaving the driver free to cope with the phenomena of transportation through traffic, destination. You don't have to worry, as a rule, about what's going on under the hood. You press the gas pedal to go faster or reduce it by re giving less gas. You step on the brakes to stop. You steer left. You steer right. But your brain is free to cope with the phenomena of the external environment in relation to your car. The communication to the parts are um, very simple. What's under the hood is very complex. But I owned a car, the Buick that I'm driving, I owned for about two or three years before I ever learned to open the hood on the car. I wanted to find out uh, how to check something under there myself one day and I didn't know how to get the hood open. I had never done it. It was uh, always done for me in a gas station. The human body, if you wanted to liken it to a machine, is the most complex thing on this planet. In other words, the complexity of what we are is of such a, it's just frightening. The complexities are enormous. We have physicians who study a good portion of their life to understand the workings of the human body. They are enormously complex. The one thing we cannot do is work with our human body as though we were the mechanic, as though we were in charge of these fiber groups that must function. In other words, uh, the tremendous complexity, this you have 659 muscles in the human body, 654 are paired as antagonists to each other. There's some variation on these thoughts depending who the researchers are, but this is very basic that it'd be approximately in this range. 654 muscles to maneuver the skeletal structures to permit you to take a glass of water, drink it, and do the things. We just don't think about this thing. If I lift this glass of water, if we put equipment 
strain gauges and were to uh, put it on the musculatures of the body, we would find in lifting this enormously uh, complex contractions coming in various parts of our anatomy so that I don't fall over because of gravitational changes. Because the weight of the arm is heavier than the scapula and back, little muscles have to fasten it down. There are changes in the order of hundreds of changes, maybe even thousands, simply by picking this up. To try to understand this and work your body by knowledge of your muscles is just foolish. To me, I have felt in uh, my studies that the way to go is the recognition that the human brain as far as complex, that we have levels of the brain that do different things. The level of the brain that we do volitional thought with, that we learn or impart knowledge from, this region of the brain has to do primarily with coping with life around us, not life within us. By that, in other words, the details of walking, I think you've all heard about, well, you know, this particular individual can't walk and talk at the same time. If he's talking, he won't have the ability to walk. Well, fortunately, we have levels of the brain that permit you to do all sorts of complex things with your body while you're talking or whatever else you're going to be doing or playing the tuba or whatsoever. What I want to bring out where it applies to our art form, and I think this is quite important, is that you have to have the thinking part of the brain programmed for the study of music. Now music is a spelling, in other words it's ink spots on a page. If you think of the word music and you're going to write it, you're going to use uh, letters and you're going to put it down as ink. Music is sound, it's a phenomenon of sound. In other words, the sensors that are going to hear it have to do with the audio aspects of our art form. We will use vision so we see uh, who's playing and so forth and I, I, I can almost tell students when I look at them and watch them play who they study with because the student without realizing it is picking up the characteristics of the teacher. I can see this so often when I, I have students, well Vincent Chikowitz was a student of mine many years ago, he teaches trumpet at Northwestern University. I can watch his students and without asking them who they study with, I'll know very much basically by what they look like, the way they hold their horn, the way they approach the aspect of playing, and of course by what they sound like. Students who study with me, I'm sure, pick up certain characteristics because the sense of sight is one of our extremely powerful learning tools. We learn so much through vision. We learn so much through sound, through touch, tactile sense. Now, our brains must take care of the internal environment. This is done very much by the study of emotion, by the body needs for hunger, for uh, respiration, for the various definite basic needs of our body. We are involved in that. But we are not involved in how the coordination phenomena of musculature is achieved. The many fiber groups that must contract in order to swing a golf club, how they're coordinated, what fibers are innervated, what ones are not. If we study products rather than methods, it is extremely simple to function. When I pick up this glass, this is a product, I have to bring it to my lips. If I have to search around and find my lips, a neurological examination would probably find there has been a disruption in the brain and possibly in the nerves that must signal the muscles or in the muscles themselves. But if I can bring it directly to my lips, I have a normalcy starting to be established where I don't have to think of the various muscles involved. When I play my instrument, I have, uh, I, I brought some equipment with me today, but these are very simple. I have to be aware of shorting out the microphones because there's a little moisture that comes out with this, but if I play on this, I, I can make music without my instrument. In other words, there's a connection with my brain and through the seventh cranial nerve, the motor nerve that's going to feed the embouchure, I have developed patterns of response in the embouchure, just like vocal cords in response to thought patterns, where these act like vocal cords. Now, in terms of embouchure, um, if I play that little message of music, the Carnival of Venice, I could do this. Or this, or the clincher. <laughs> I know that's a foolish looking sight, but um, I do it for a reason because I want the attention to go off the embouchure 
and on to the fact that the lips must vibrate. They must vibrate because the horn picks up vibration and amplifies it as sound waves. Air going through the instrument is not amplified. You'll hear a noise of air, but you don't play by air, you play by sound. If we could use electronic stimulation to vibrate the lips, we wouldn't need air, but we would need vibration. Well, unfortunately, we can't use electronics to vibrate our embouchures, so we must use breath. Now, I'm noted as a teacher. I have developed quite a reputation as a specialist in the use of respiratory function and wind instrument playing and singing. I like to put the subject into perspective. It's a very important subject, but it has to do uh, with being a live human being, not just being a musician. See, the body really knows nothing about trumpet playing or tuba playing or French horn playing. These are additives. These are th things that we put into our development. But base our basic structure is simply to survive on this planet. And what our body does, we make use of some of these factors in order to buzz that mouthpiece or play a trumpet or sing or whatever. But this was not, I don't think, I don't know about this, but I suspect it was not in the original design, but occurred as a developmental aspect as um, people continue to survive on this planet. We think of respiration. You can't really study the phenomena of respiration without studying childbirth, strange as it seems. Today there's more recognition of this in the natural childbirth and what they do with the breath to help. But when you think of the respiratory musculature, um, it is involved in three phenomena in life. Two have nothing really to do with the direct aspect of gas exchange and respiration, but have to do with the supportive aspect of respiration to downward contracting diaphragms, in other words, increasing intra-abdominal or pelvic pressures. In other words, in childbirth now, which is well known, or defecation, there is a bearing down where a person will take a breath. You watch a small child, you take a breath, and the face will turn red when they have to eliminate feces. And there's this sort of thing, the face will turn red, you can see the blood pressure going up. They have what they call the valsalva maneuver, a closing of the larynx, which acts as a stopper to the respiratory system. In the meantime, after having taken a breath, the rib cage will contract and help increase air pressure to push down on a downward contracting diaphragm. If the, um, um, what will I say, if the pressure has to be very great, the, the person will show distress signs very, very quickly. And if you palpate or touch the internal uh, structure of the individual, you'll feel great contraction states in the abdominal region. When these are in isometric contraction of this type, you are getting the potential of vast increase in intra-abdominal pressure. If there's a weakness in the uh, walls of the abdomen or in the inguinal region, you may actually pop tissue. You could have hernia, you could rupture yourself. There are potentials of problems with this that we have to guard against. But it is difficult to use your air in quantity at that time. You can open the larynx and use it under great pressure in small quantity because the muscles are in contraction against each other and as a result they cannot move fairly freely in large maneuvers. So it's perfectly all right. This maneuver fits fine in powerful blowing of small quantities which you would have on piccolo trumpet. You would have on oboe because you don't need many liters of air per, in per minute flow rate. So it can be put under intensive pressure through this particular maneuver, which in life belongs to the pelvic pressure syndrome. There's another maneuver, which we all have, and that would be in certain athletic procedures or combat situations where you harden the frontal abdominal wall. Sheldon, would you come over here a minute so that I can make use of your body? Oh, sure. <laughs> I thought I was just equipped. Are we still on the air? Yes, we are now. But uh, I'll use Dr. Kirshner here. Um, how flaccid can you make this? It's pretty flaccid. <laughs> <I'm the doctor. laughs> but actually, if you're not using your biceps for anything and we touch it, it should be pretty flaccid too. Muscles that are not in use will have muscle tone. In other words, a small number of fibers out of each uh, muscle group will be innervated but you're not doing anything. So if out of, uh, we'll say there's a thousand fibers, if 
15 or 20 are innervated just to have muscle tone, this is a healthy situation. What I would not want to feel is a powerful contraction as I palpate this region. In other words, that would simply mean that there are large muscle groups that are fighting each other. It will bring about fatigue states. It will desensitize the region in terms of some of the sensitive functions that we need. I touch uh, people in this region quite frequently, and uh, so I'm very familiar. You're overweight, Sheldon. <laughs> 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 it's a good thing this is all in private. I know, I know. I had a singer from the Metropolitan Opera come to see me last week, and I was working with him, and I had to say the same thing. I mean, I couldn't even feel the ribs. I, I was... Uh, it, it, it was and I you know, sing there next week. <laughs> uh, actually, this interferes with our functions. It's not good for health, and really, we can play in spite of this, because we have pulmonary reserves and so forth that are sufficient that we can get by without it. But you have to recognize that in an art form, we are not using the strengths that we have as a, um, what will I say, um, the potential. I could give an example. Ron, could you come up here? I know that Ron Bishop, besides being a splendid musician and the tuba player of the um, uh, Cleveland Orchestra, is actually basically a fine physical specimen. Do you think... <laughs> well, I, I touch him here. <laughs> There, everything is just as it should be. Sheldon, please forgive me. <clears throat> would you permit me to invite a small young lady to come up, and would you lay flat on your back and let me uh, have this young lady come and remove her shoes and stand on your chest and abdomen as a graphic uh, illustration of the power of this particular region of the anatomy. In other words, this young man could easily hold a 150-pound person by going into isometric contraction. These are muscles that are used in respiratory function and wind instrument playing. They have contraction power that is just simply enormous. Then I'll show after this. Would you permit me to do that? You're my teacher. <laughs> Can I ask some young person, some small person, to come up here without spike heels. And um, <laughs> there's... He's all heart. I know, I know. You notice I always have somebody else lie on the floor. I'm too old to enjoy this thing anyway. <laughs> there we are. Now you see. You'll thank me for this, Ron. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to display... Here's this lovely young lady, and she's equipped beautifully. Uh, I am I'm speaking of the shoes, and I want to give this as a rather graphic demonstration. And then, Sheldon, would you take out the sphygmomanometer? Then we're going to see how much power, and this is a powerful man, we're going to see just actually how much breath power he has. Would you mind laying flat on the store, uh, floor? Store? Uh, don't step on this tuba. I have a sphygmomanometer here that um, it's a mercury column that your physician uses when he wants to measure your blood pressure. And um, I want to see just what power we can generate by what you call a, a closed circuit static breath pressure test. This is a very good indication of actually what our potentials are. And this, uh, we need a knife blade. Do you have a knife blade? Yeah. Good. Yeah, we have to hold this button down. Nothing, nothing ever works when you want it, you know. That's why the human body, you have excellent, excellent controls. Everything always works unless you spoil it and get in the way. But things we make don't always work. Now, 
I failed to bring some of my equipment with me. Would you, would you mind taking this tube, and we're going to see how much power you can generate blowing as hard as you can. Now, he went up to 100, millime 100 millimeters of mercury. That's approximately two pounds. I'm short uh, a little mercury in here, so we're going to give him a bonus and put it as 120 millimeters of mercury because I'm a little short on mercury. So, in other words, this would be, well, we'll call it two and a third pounds of uh, static breath pressure test. The maximum is usually around three pounds. This is for powerful young men. Now, in playing tuba, when I'm thinking in terms of pounds and ounces rather than millimeters of mercury or other aspects. But in terms of ounces, when Ron plays the tuba and we put a little intravenous tubing into the oral cavity, he will be using on a low C maybe approximately three ounces of intraoral pressure. I have the figures from research in the book based on dynamic levels. I'll, uh, and it'll become six ounces and the upper range, if it's fairly loud, and the high range, it'll be about 12 ounces. Well, here you've got three pounds, uh, two and a third pounds. He's not even going to come close to that. On trumpet, playing very loud in the high range, you'll use it all. You may go up to three pounds of intraoral pressure. I have players that, uh, when I do uh, closed circuit tests of this type, actually could generate better than three pounds. I've never seen it go past about three and three quarter pounds. Uh, but we never use this on any instrument. It's not a question of brute force. Now, what I want to indicate, this young lady's uh, weight was supported by muscles that actually in Gray's Anatomy will be listed as muscles of expiration and inspiration. And they're used for other things, of course, in life. But you can't equate the 100 pounds. You weigh about 90 pounds, 100 pounds? Well, there's a, there, so there's 100 pounds supported with great ease, wasn't it? Pleasure. Of course, I knew it would be. <laughs> you know, as I say, the study of analogous situations is, is the way you communicate. Subjects of this type, when you use verbalizations, you're just talking about um, the problems, the impact is not there. The understanding it really is not there. And uh, we have to somehow bring this state of awareness in of what the complexity of what we are and the potentials in life rather than in music. Now in music, it is, um, what will I say, uh, there's a conditioning that the young player must go through right from his very first lesson. We have to have scales, we have to have interval studies, we have to have studies of the music of the day. But we take a young mind and then the ability of that mind to um, be stimulated into music, because you do, this is what you do with a young player that wants to play. I can give you some illustrations and this has to do with the Suzuki method and um, I think I can best express it by talking a little about myself. I was born in Philadelphia um, a long time ago. I'll be 69 on June the 11th, so that's many years ago. Anyway, at, I was born into a musical family. But in those days, we didn't have radio. When the radio was just coming in, and they used to use copper wire wrapped around an oatmeal box. And they would have a little crystal and earphones. And if you were lucky enough, there was a radio station somewhere close by, you would hear something. And, of course, that meant that we didn't have the advantage of uh, hearing a great deal of music on radio or uh, being exposed to the things that normally you would be exposed to on television and so forth. We had to make, what will I say, our own entertainment at home. My mother was a professional pianist, very fine one. And when um, I was about six months old, we left Philadelphia and moved to California, to Long Beach, California. And I grew up in California. And in the years when I first became interested in music, we lived in a little town called Willowbrook on the edge of the California desert. Well, you know, there are no street lights. It's a town of four or 500. And it was great. But um, uh, my mother, being a professional pianist, used to play hours and hours a day. And for entertainment, we would sing. 
We would get around the piano and sing, but I, my brain was being flooded with sound. I was not only the recipient of sound, but I had to produce sound because I was using song, which meant the sensors were gathering in information and the brain was getting to receive sound and recognition quite well. But I was also using the psychomotor phenomena of uh, motor activity to influence others through sound. It was in the factor of song. When I was 10 or 11, I there was a Boy Scout troop. Anyway, I, I uh, wanted a bugle. And so my parents bought me a bugle, and my mother would play bugle calls uh, on the piano, and I would listen to them. And I learned to play a bugle by ear. I think you can readily find the Suzuki aspect. Here, a young child is learning by ear, learning to produce sounds, first hearing, then producing it. So the phenomena of imitation is one of our very, very powerful learning tools. Right, Dr. Sheldon? Right. Uh, it is one of our very, very powerful tools for learning. The sense of sight is extremely powerful. Imitation of sound and sight, uh, both two senses reinforcing each other, is one of the ways to go. But in my own development, I worked uh, with my mother. I remember becoming a... Um, Scout, they put me in uniform before I was old enough to be a scout, but they needed a bugler. So I was a success on the bugle. I remember going down these dark streets at night playing my bugle, much to the horror of the neighbors, and uh, uh, making a real pest out of myself. But I won a silver plated bugle when I was uh, quite young uh, in scout competition. Then I asked my father, Can I have a trumpet? So he brought me a trumpet, but no instruction book, just a trumpet. So I didn't even have anything to look at. My mother, again, being bugle, naturally, I was able to play the seven bugles of the trumpets, the seven positions of the vowels, and she would play, and I would figure out fingerings and write them down because we didn't have the instruction book. I often think of that in my career after that, that that really was quite a good thing to do because, again, if you think of the human brain, it was developing in terms of functional ability, both in the receiving of sound and what is very important is not just to listen to music, but to turn around and influence the external environment by producing music. It's quite different what you get through sensors and what you impart through motor systems. So the encouragement of the child, like in the Suzuki method and so forth, the uh, constant repetition, which is a conditioning factor for the brain in the learning process, and the ability of muscles to respond to these thoughts being put out in a beautiful way. This happens so much. I, I, I have students that come to me, and uh, one of the first things I ask them to do is play something by memory. If they can't think of any, I say, I don't care what it is. It could be my country, it is of thee, or the Star Spangled Banner, or it could be some rock or some Dixieland. I don't care what it is. I want them playing something they conceive and teach me. And in other words, psychomotor. You influence the external environment through motor systems. Our excellence in learning is through sensors. But how excellent are we at imparting knowledge? This has to be done. You influence the external environment, no matter what you do, through motor systems. If I move this microphone, I'm doing it through motor systems. When I talk to you, I'm using motor systems. When you talk to me and I'm listening, you're listening to me, you're using sensors. So we have to make very, very sure, those of us that teach and those of us that are going to be in the art form of music, that you don't get so involved in music with the spelling, M-U-S-I-C, and that you don't get so involved in talking about music. You have to get involved in playing music. When you put up a sheet of music, you learn what's on the page. But just like an actor on the stage, you very quickly reverse this as to what it will sound like for anybody that's listening to the music. As soon as you start interpreting, uh, there is a change immediately from the act of learning. I remember, if, if you read a phrase of some kind, whatever it would be, in other words, uh, a story. Once upon a time, a long time ago, in a far off land, there lived a little boy. Well, you stand on the stage. Once upon a time, a long time ago, in a far off land, there lived a little boy. It's far different when you impart knowledge to somebody else than when you're learning it for yourself. Or well, those of you that teach, those of you that play should always have somebody in your imagination that you're playing for. I watch 
stu uh, people in my studio and they're learning something, they're looking and they're reading it just like they would a textbook. In other words, they're very strong act of learning and human beings are wonderful in the act of learning. In other words, our superiority in the learning sense, when you take a young child born in this world, and it's well known the tremendous power of learning the youngster has, acquiring information that comes through sensors to the brain, learning, learning, learning. How excellent are they at influencing the external environment, external environment by imparting information? This is what we have to realize with ourselves that there has to be a deliberate effort on all of our parts to begin to communicate to others with our music, to become a storyteller of sound and phrase, emotion, and all the phenomena that we use in our art form. Now, we can't take this for granted. Admittedly, there will be students that come to me that have this, and have it in copious quantities. We don't have to worry much about it. Then there comes another boy who may be an A student in physics, but he doesn't tell a story when he plays. He's thinking of the phenomena of measurement. That doesn't mean that he's without talent. It simply means that this young man then has to be made to realize that there are emotions to music and that the tools of it will be uh, emotion in the brain. We have to deal with specific phenomena of patterns of response in tissue. Now these have become conditioned reflexes. That means we must provide stimulus. There is no such thing as a response without a stimuli. So the problems that we have actually go further and further into the brain. If we want a fine embouchure, we have to develop it by playing music. We have to do it by what we do with music. Now, in the development of tissue, we have what you call hypertrophy of fibers, where they enlarge and strengthen. Well, this comes in the act of playing. It does not come by instructions on how to use your lip. In the elementary stages, the lip has not gone through hypertrophy. hypertrophy. These fibers are not going to be able to have much range. They won't have much ability of change. All things will be crude. In the study of physical skills, you find always that you start out with crudeness and develop skills. That's with any muscle group, whether it's golf or whether it's playing a tuba. So we have to make sure that a student is allowed to develop and you do this by encouraging excellence in the conceptual thought and permitting mistakes. No big deal if somebody makes a mistake, so they make a mistake. But what were the thoughts when they were making the mistake? So I really encourage a tremendous uh, uh, effort for the art form. Then I want the disciplines of practice. I believe in that thoroughly because of the conditioning factors involved. To me, a scale is like a prize fighter punching a bag and jumping a rope. But I want that scale to be more than punching a bag or jumping a rope. I want it to be a cadenza from Mozart, or I want it to be a uh, part of a good jazz figure. In other words, we put it right back into the art form of music. So what I'm doing is working with a human being who plays a musical instrument, a piece of brass in a hand. That brass has no brains. So we cannot, what will I say, limit ourselves to the potential of the brass and say, well, I'm learning to play a trumpet or I'm learning to play a horn or a tuba. You're learning to play music with these instruments. So the dominance is the sound that comes out of the bell. And it's like circuitry in electronics. You conceive the sound you want, either by imitating the teacher or a colleague or a record, but you conceive and then you listen to find out if you sound like what you want to sound like. The important thing is not what you sound like, it's what do you want to sound like. I put it on the basis of 85% of the intellectual approach to music is conceptual thought. 15% is the readout that comes out the bell of the horn, which is sensory. In other words, what do you sound like? To me, I have people that come that only listen to themselves. They're not conceiving. Well, the horn has no brains. In other words, it can't really give you anything. You have to give it to the horn. As I mentioned the other day, there are three basics to tone production, no matter how you do it. There has to be a motor function, there has to be a source of vibration, and there has to be resonance. These three functions, if you think about it, go through sound phenomena, no matter what it is or where it is. When they send out a piano from the factory, for those that were not at the um, pedagogy class the other day, the piano is sent to the home with pitch vibration and resonance built in by the factory. You provide the motor function by what you do with your hands. In other words, it's very demanding. It, 
piano is an extremely difficult instrument to play and play well, and there must be great artists to do a fine job. But the factory does send the instrument out with pitch vibration resonance built in. It has a soundboard, which we call forced resonance. It's one soundboard that resonates all frequencies. The entire 88 keys are resonated by a single soundboard. The trumpet player has an instrument where there is a strong element of sympathetic vibration involved. Only certain partials will respond to vibration. Others will not. You'd have to try to force them through, but you can't do it. A half valve, you might get something through. But basically, the instrument, you have to send in a frequency of vibration that the horn can resonate, which means amplification of sound. I did some research with my tuba, and um, when I would put in a sound, in other words, a sound wave, a <laughs> when I would, that would come out the bell of the horn, that would have amplified about 20 decibels, which is an enormous amplification of the amount of vibration that went in. But I'm sending, <laughs> and out comes, bum, 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 it's a big sound, you know, because it is amplified by that instrument. Now, we have to bring into recognition that all brass players actually sing with their lips. And the horn has acoustical laws that must be obeyed, but you must send in the right note. It'll deflect in the lower range of the instrument where the parcels are fairly wide apart. You'll find that you're able to um, uh, get the notes because they are easier to come out on a low C and a G in a middle C or B flat, F and B flat, to get between them, you have to work like the Dickens to try to force anything out. But if you want resonance, you have to send in the... ...talk too much because uh, I know there are other things going on right after this. And I do want to open this to questions. Uh, I see it's already 11.53. Let me stop here and have some hands and see if you want me to amplify or go into any other factors that I may not have touched on now. Let's do that now. Any questions? Yes, sir. How about uh, your ideas on playing the lips alone without the mouth? Playing simple melodies and There are benefits from this, but I don't like it too much. There's a strange thing about the mouth musculature. In fact, all of the facial musculature, most of the muscles of the body are bundled into groups and bound by connective tissue called fascia. Uh, the facial musculature does not have that. What gives the face its tremendous motility of expression is the phenomena of free muscles that are not bound by connective tissue. And in the lip musculature, one of the things I did the demonstration, I played across the entire mouth. And if you'll remember, those of you who are up in years, Vic Hyde, the trumpet player, used to come out with three trumpets. Um, the signal from the brain goes across the entire mouth. Now, the way the lip is structured, the um, mouthpiece is needed, actually, the rim is needed to isolate the region of function. Uh, it's very hard to control, in a sense, that without some isolation, the, uh, where the muscles interdigitate at the corner of the mouth, you will find the first phase of isolation. The second would be where the mouthpiece is. <laughs> and we can do it the other way. There are benefits to that, but there are even more benefits if you do it with a mouthpiece. Now, the mouthpiece work I consider very important when you have remedial cases that you're working with, or if a student wants to check himself out, playing on the mouthpiece removes the acoustical device. When you want to have change or you want to test yourself, what is the brain doing? It is wonderful to sing a part and play it on the mouthpiece. By removing the horn, you have removed one of the powerful forms of stimulus that develops over the years. A person picks up the horn, puts his hand in position, notes pop into the head. There's all sorts of stimuli involved with the instrument. If there's something wrong and we want to introduce change, I immediately remove the trumpet but have him play on the mouthpiece so that he is forced into recall and mentalization. Now, to remove the instrument and do that, it forces you into the recall, and we can immediately concentrate more on the musical factor because there still has all of the tissues that are involved in playing the instrument are involved in playing the mouthpiece, every one except the right hand or left hand, depending on the instrument. But the making of music is still involved in brain and reflex response, conditioned response in the embouchure to thought. If you just think of vocal cord activity, 
you'll find that the lips actually become the vocal cords of the brass instrument. This can be documented and learned. There are complicating thoughts, but this is the basic aspect of playing a brass instrument. You're very close to singing because the factory sent out a, a brass instrument that has only the ability to resonate according to its acoustical laws. It does not have the ability to provide you the pitch and just blow in, like in some of the woodwinds, I understand that you vibrate the reed and then the instrument will provide the pitch. So the brass instrument is very close to singing and I think the brass player should consider himself mentally very close to the act of singing. Not in a technical sense of physical application, but in the musical sense of vocal cord activity in the embouchure, expressing your thoughts with it. There's great benefit to making music with the lips, but I would strongly suggest the use of a rim of the mouthpiece. I came upon this uh, when I was young. The first girl I ever kissed gave me a disease. And uh, <coughs> that's a terrible thing. I was only 11, I think, something like that, and we were playing spin the bottle. And um, I kissed this girl in playing spin the bottle, and she had scarlet fever. And uh, I came down with scarlet fever, and uh, I developed a complication, which was nephritis, a very dangerous ailment. And I spent a long time in the hospital. This is before antibiotics, you know, way back. And the treatment was very rough, hot packs that make you sweat and give you digitalis to keep the heart going. And anyway, um, when I began to feel better and I was off the critical list, my mother brought my mouthpieces down and I drove everybody crazy. I played on the mouthpieces, everything I could think of. And I had a large musical background from my mother's playing and I would play Poet and Peasant Overture and the mouthpiece and all sorts of songs that would sing and Arben's trumpet music and so forth. When I came out of the hospital a couple of months later, and I picked up the trumpet, it took me a couple of moments to find the partials, but I played better than when I went in. And I realized this is a fabulous tool, and I use it a great deal in teaching. When I want to focus on the mentalization, I have to create strangeness. If we want to change a situation of response, you don't do it by the study of the muscle that's responding. You do it by the study of the stimuli that's causing the muscle to respond. You must change the stimulus in order to change the pattern of response. To do that, to do that you introduce strangeness, or you can't create change. If everything feels the same, and it's not going to change. It'll be the first student will be frustrated, but he can't do anything. He has to alter the motivation. Now, uh, let me have some more questions. If we have a few moments for it. Anybody want to know? Pick my brain a little? Yes. Besides breathing in large volume and trying to relax, what helps to breathe freely and steadily? <laughs> the key to inhalation, again, is to go back to the study of the human being and don't go to the study of respiratory functions based on the machine, but to find the ability to inhale based on suction with minimal friction. In other words, suction is the clue for the diaphragmatic descent. If you were to fluoroscope a person taking a breath based on the free movements of air and of this type, you will find that there's a center of the brain that has wonderful, wonderful efficiency that you're communicating with. You're ordering a w large volume of air into the mouth. You're not guiding it based on the physical phenomena of uh, what we know, according to Boyle's law, to be the enlargement phenomena of the thorax. So you're going to the psychological attitudes of respiration. <clears throat> and yawning without opening your mouth wide is a wonderful tool. Very little strength involved. What we don't, what we don't want is resistances. Now, I do have some devices here while we have just a moment. Uh, Sheldon, would you? <clears throat> Just maybe some of you have seen these before, but there's a young man in Las Vegas, <clears throat> I think it's called Casino Enterprises, and his name of all things is Howard Hansen, and he does not conduct. But <clears throat> he makes these respiratory devices, and they sell rather cheaply. They are not versatile in terms of flow rates, and it takes about maybe 10 ounces of negative pressure to pull this ball up, now you have to blow it up, excuse me, I'd be in the wrong direction. Now 
you do this actually and hold the ball in place as long as you can and ensuring then frog and tip relationships in the use of the breath because we must introduce quantity to respiration you may have a long long bow and you should be able to move from frog to tip now most of the music is not made from frog to tip it's somewhere somewhere in between and the same thing here we don't use the extremes of filling or the extremes of venting the excellence comes sir, somewhere in between but there is a large volume of air the potentials run from maybe the little lady that was just here probably about uh, three liters and uh, some of you large men are going to be seven liters in other words the variation in individuals in quantity is enormous and uh, I have the blackboard here usually my lectures take about two hours because I like to go into uh, diagramming these and making a visual presentation for better understanding but there won't be time to do that today so you have to take me sort of uh, at, on faith on this but we need to have the ability to move large quantities of air in and out of the mouth if it goes in and out of the mouth there is no way to have a large quantity of air go in the mouth without it going to the right places it will automatically be there because you can't take a large quantity without the proper inflation of the lungs and the same thing in moving it out I want the psychology of respiration not to be the physical apparatus but how much air do you take in and how much air do you blow out I found that you must always tell the truth to the body Sheldon please <clears throat> I want you to um, would you mind doing that I hope I'm not uh, infected or anything but uh, after the hospitalization I must be sterile in every way <laughs> try it <laughs> take a chance blow it up expose the ball or get your hands out of the way now you have to blow now keep the ball up now pull her way up and hold it as long you'll see a general expansion a, thoras a thoracic expansion enlargement and reductions he's doing it in response to this ball and continue until you can't take any more that's it and there'll be gross change and so forth I prefer not to put restrictions don't move the shoulder don't do this I prefer to get comfortably large quantities of air in the study of physical skills you don't worry so much about what's wrong as to what has to be right now frequently things will start somewhat wrong if I push you'll fall over a hyperventilation starts in about after three complete gas exchanges done fairly rapidly he's not quite to that there this this doesn't do it rapidly enough now would you get me that little box that's in there no we'll take a tube instead there you go. it's the wrong box well <laughs> that's all right. we'll use this then by introducing a tube in the mouth of one of your students or those of you that are interested in this subject and yawn through it just a huge but do it as freely and as weak as you can and put it well into the oral cavity so that the tongue cannot block it now just let it out free now suck the air but gently now again you'll see the same pattern of enlargement coming in in other words he's taking large volumes of air and taking it with minimal effort the main thing is this region of the anatomy could through isometrics generate 150 pounds of contraction we're looking for free movements similar to the bow not forced based on contractions that don't fit the power requirement of the instrument so we have to bring this down to a minimal state what in physiology is called the use of minimal motors easier and easier to accomplish whatever you're trying to accomplish that's why an athlete does everything so freely we do the same thing in music don't keep it up Sheldon or <laughs> <coughs> there are other devices um, this is a little gadget here that actually measures flow rate according to quantities of air it has it has a specific size and uh, it's like a duck call it's very easy to use we're just going to set it at 180 liters per minute Sheldon would you be so kind as to blow through that you'll hear a squawk don't cover the holes with your hands don't break it either <laughs> now breathe in and you're, you'll hear uh, open the holes it has to be in the three that's on three now suck air through it 
Now we hear sound, and of course we know then once that sound activates that uh, he's moving a specific volume of air. These things, I think, are under $10. And, uh, anyway, would you move 480 liters per minute now? Hold it by this unit here. Now blow through it first. You're just barely making it, just barely making it. There's a considerable volume. Would you put it in further? Now breathe in through it. It has to be a massive, large movement of air, or it will not activate this. I have a little device here. It's a spirometer, spira having to do with breath. It's a breath meter. It's not a conventional type, but it works. It's not completely accurate, but it's close enough. Uh, it's close enough to be a functional unit. Now, I'm going to have Sheldon blow in this as fast as you can. It's like a siren. Take a huge breath, put this so the tongue cannot occlude the port, and move your air through as fast and as complete as you can. Make it as loud and noisy as you can. This is, it'll act like a siren. Right. Now it'll read out his lung volumes. Now there's 4,400 milliliters that he's showing in this, which is uh, a very good breath for a little fellow who is somewhat overweight. <laughs> If Shelley would take off 20 pounds, he would move over the 500, uh, uh, 5,000 milliliter mark. He'd have an excess of five liters. Now, with a little training, he probably would even right now. Is there somebody up there that would like to uh, try this? Do we? I don't know whether I'm past 12 o'clock. I don't know whether to stop now or go on. Keep going. Uh, the little lady that was here a moment ago, would you come up and let's measure your lung capacity with this. I like the more sophisticated spirometric, spirometric units uh, for measuring lung volumes. They're more accurate, but this is reasonably close. And I just want to, uh, you to get a difference between small and large. Would you mind, this is like a kiss by proxy, so I hope you like them. Would you uh, take a huge breath? Now what you have to do is inhale you, you inhale as though you're going to swim. <laughs> the idea, you think of swimming underwater for two lengths of a good sized swimming pool when you breathe in, just <sighs> continuous inhalation. You blow up like a giant balloon. And then you send it in where we would measure velocity and quantity, uh, so both aspects are being measured. Would you think of the swimming pool now and yawn and then put this this inside your mouth so the tongue cannot occlude the port. And then, fast as you can blow, it's like a siren, make a lot of noise. Bravo, this is better than mine, I can tell them by the pitch. Absolutely, 3,590 milliliters, which is excellent. You're only about five, one? You're not even, now this is marvelous, but see the, the somatotype of the individual is involved. It has to do with the length of the torso, length of the legs, weight, and age. You're how old? Well, oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> is there anybody here about six, two, three, or four that would like to do this? Please, six foot is good enough. Thank you very much. Again, take a preliminary breath for me, just so I can look at you. You want to tell me about this first? No, leave that alone. <laughs> take a big yawn. Just, in other words, this is not music. Forget about right or wrong. Forget about uh, formula and breathing. Just take in all the air so you create a vacuum in the room. And then move it through here. You understand? Uh, uh, then you run it through here as fast as you can. But put this far enough in the mouth that you cannot occlude the port with your tongue. Don't breathe through that. Room air first. Then you, it's one way into that. 
Now, he did beautifully, but he didn't take a full breath. He still has more than this. Whatever this is, you have much more. Well, now, this is 3,700 milliliters. I do almost that well. I know it. You, know, you see, your lungs go this high in the body. They go right up to the clavicles. In other words, in the complete capacity breath, there has to be, there will not be a complete breath without movement of this particular region. Don't be afraid to move it. You're not playing. You know what I mean? Yeah, I want you to try it again, but this time I want a real breath. Give me your hand. Put it over here. I have fun teaching. <laughs> Could you sense the movement of the sternum? Now, there is no complete breath without sternal movement. There are no complete breaths without... Can you feel the diaphragmatic descent, displacement? There are no complete breaths without the bellows expanding in all planes as far as it can. Now, I don't want you to think so much in terms of the meat. I want you to think in terms of the air. Blow your breath out. Wait for it till you turn blue. And then inhale. Take a mighty inhalation and try to break it. Still not a complete breath. You better come and see me in Chicago. <laughs> How much? <laughs> Now, this time, it was only 3,500 milliliters. I can tell you, I can tell you by, uh, I can tell by looking at this gentleman that he has well over five liters. Now, he is not taking it, which means there has been a prior conditioning to where he is using limit. He could probably be the best player in the world. It wouldn't matter. In other words, he's, he's got more than enough for what he's trying to accomplish. But somewhere, there is a block and I know where it is, simply, that uh, he is expanding to breathe where he should be breathing to expand. In other words, he is creating a physical maneuver. Shelley, would you come here a moment? Now, I'm going to simulate, may I have your hand? Just put it on the abdominal region, what we call diaphragmatic breathing. You can probably see it moving in and out. Now, I'm not breathing at all, right? Any difference? Except for air, no. Well. No difference. <laughs> the body could lie. The body could lie like crazy. In other words, if you're going by displacement of musculatures, which is a pseudo activity, in other words, you've lied to your body. You've ordered your body to change in order to get the air. If you told the truth, you would have ordered the air into the mouth and the body would then would have been under activity of the centers of the brain that control these functions. And you would have had wonderful efficiency, which is very easy to achieve. Now, I, when I teach this subject, we do it away from music. In other words, when the horn is in the hand, we want the art form dominance. So when we have to do work away from music, we'd immediately go to... Uh, what will I say, sort of a specialized approach in respiration where we bring in multiple senses. The sense of sight through the use of equipment that the breath has to hold a ball in a certain place or through uh, spirometric equipment. But we teach respiration as a human being studying respiration, not a musician. And once we normalize it as a human being, then we reapply it to the instrument and it's done with great simplicity, not complexity. If, it's tr if you try to do this while playing, the student gets frustrated or the person will be frustrated. He's, he's trying to think of the techniques of musculature activity, all sorts of work. And the first thing, music is out of the brain, and I never permit that. I don't want anything to do with the phenomena of playing without the art form dominance. I think it's extremely important. Any questions about what we were just doing? Yes? Are there situations in which uh, playing Well, I do it all the time because uh, I'll show you why. <coughs> That's 3,450 milliliters, which is the best breath I've had in probably two years. <laughs> <laughs> It was down to 2,750 uh, milliliters, which is not enough to play a contrabass tuba 
in a professional organization like the Chicago Symphony, but I lie a lot. I cheat, and I sneak breaths where they shouldn't be, but I do it so fast that nobody knows it. And uh, it's a little bow, so I change it often, and I get by with it. But uh, it's much easier. My breath capacity as a young man was about 4,750 milliliters. I have students, one of them has 7,400 milliliters, just uh, over seven quarts, where at my best, I was under five. Chester Schmitz, who was here yesterday giving a lecture, I have a spirogram of Chester of, I think, 5,500 milliliters. Roger Bobo, 6,400. And uh, I have never had 5,000 liters, but I had excellence in playing because it's a smaller bow. I just change it when I need to. But I do it based on musical phenomena and good taste and how to phrase and so forth. And I can use the ear quite well. Now, I have not done this good. This is the first time I've been up uh, this high uh, since my initial ailment started up. But in losing weight, overweight cuts down on lung volumes and age cuts down. There's an aging process which you should know about because when you form your habits when you're 18 years old like this little lady, the amount of air that you move, or this young man here, the amount of air that you move at that time, there's a signal that goes to the brain on muscle expansion. And the same amount of expansion when you're 20 that will move, we'll say, four and a half liters or five liters, when you're 50, the exact same motions, if you put pneumographs and study the amount of motility and change, you'll find that instead of five liters, you've got four and a quarter liters. In other words, their throat begins to change, their tongue begins to give you problems. There are all sorts of changes in the playing because you have less air and it moves less freely than when you're young. If you take large general inflations, this doesn't happen. You'll get out of breath a little faster, but you won't stimulate the reflexes on the upper end of the respiratory system. It's dangerous to get out of breath, in other words. It's dangerous to have too little. So it is wonderful to have air to waste, and I teach this. Always waste your breath. Don't make a big deal out of it. Take enough in that you can be comfortable at the end of the phrase. If you can't be comfortable at the end of the phrase, then with good taste, break in and make a subphrase and take a breath. But don't get out of breath and particularly those of you who are going for auditions, you must make sure that um, uh, under stress you will use actually your air up much faster than you would in the conditions of studio playing. You'll find your pulse rate goes up when you're, you're a little stage fright, respiration becomes a little shallow and rapid. The conditions which you've carried it all the way to completion would be hysteria, starts up in a minor way, uh, in uh, students or young people waiting for auditions. It's rather an agonizing experience. One of the things you must do to counter that is immediately you start inhaling slow, large breaths. Four counts in, four counts out, five, whatever. But you counter the tendency to have short, rapid breathing by slow, quantitative breathing. This starts to reverse the pulse rate. It starts to normalize the system. It's in psychosomatic aspects of mind-body relationship. So by normalizing the breath, you begin a normalizing pattern in your emotional state as well. Then when you go on the stage to play, you don't start wondering about whether you're going to make it. You don't start thinking, gee, I'm uncomfortable. I, I felt better at home, or that man played so good. How can I? You sing in your head. You provide powerful stimuli for the conditioned response. The worse you feel, the more musical you get in the brain. For some years, as I've been aging and had illness, going on the stage has been quite difficult for me because medications would dry the saliva, or I would have feelings of great discomfort and so forth due to the illnesses. I don't think I sounded any different at all. My colleagues told me it sounds just like it always did and sometimes even better. So I say you lie. They make the audience they say it's great. You know what I mean? And, um, and more musical. The worse it would, I would feel, the more I depended on the psychology of playing rather than the feedback of sensory perception of my own body. And I kept getting by through all this time, and I can still play.
and what I'm trying to indicate, those of you who are under stress in playing, the way to go is further into music in terms of mentalizing. I frequently will take young people and write out a little phrase, and I make them sing the phrase with words. Then when they play a French horn, or when they play a trombone or a tuba or a trumpet, I make them think of the words and the pitch. I don't let them think of the trumpet. I make them think of the voice. And invariably, there's improvement. But the answers lie not in the study of what goes wrong in tissue, but what controls the tissue. We go through that control panel, just like the automobile. We have magnificent controls if we only learn to communicate to our tissues. And the musician communicates to his tissues through the concepts of music that he wants others to hear. This is an important statement because in practicing, you're hearing yourself and you become the audience. Somewhere, you have to put somebody else there, even if you just pretend somebody's standing behind the door with a wonderful job. You play for him. Or like with my trumpet players, I'll say, now you've heard Bud Hurst play this passage. Think about a moment and demonstrate to the audience what Bud sounds not like, not what you sound like. They sound great right away. And it's says, he's a much better player. Well, they're doing it. <laughs> and... Uh, if we can bring about change like that, you try it yourself, those of you. You think of a great artist playing a wonderful phrase, and don't think of yourself. Think of what he sounds like. You always start to sound like what you're thinking about. So you have to realize that's a magnificent tool. Use it. Well, I've always used it all my life because I didn't know any better. I used to wonder why Fritz Reiner couldn't get me nervous and shake me up because I've seen him break players by uh, just having them play and criticizing it over and over. And he would call you stupid or you're no talent and send you home. And I've watched him with string players. You'd bring somebody up from a rear stand violin and put him on first. He'd have the second clarinet play the first clarinet. <laughs> he was insulting as could be, a magnificent, wonderful conductor, the best I've ever worked with. But as a human being, he had a few little shortcomings there. <laughs> <laughs> But he would uh, ask for things, and I never realized this until later years I was studying this subject, why he could never shake me up. I used to, he would ask for things. He'd say, I want this note shorter. I want this phrased this way, and he'd sing it. I wouldn't think of his, of his words. I would hear in my head what he wanted this to sound like. Even if I was wrong, I always went by a mental picture of the resultant sound the way he wanted it. I didn't think words. In other words, I converted shortness into what, what it would have sound like shorter, not how it was spelled, you know, and, or the phrase as he sang it, I would imitate his singing. As a result, it always came that way. But in questioning students, I thought everybody did this, in questioning people, I found that many people don't do that. They, they think shorter, and they say, I will play this note shorter, but they fail to provide the stimuli that would bring about the conditioned response as reflex. If you don't communicate to the embouchure through stimulus, you can't change. And uh, it has to be changed in the brain, not in the meat. The meat will change, and it's all right to have certain awarenesses of embouchure as long as they're held to a minimal state. The big factor is the conceptual thought. Um, I could go on like this for hours, and uh, I know that uh, I'm way over. One more question. Yes. Could you play a little for us, please? I'll maybe make up a cadenza. <clears throat> I always hate to play at the end of a clinic because the mouth is dry and the conditions are terrible, but I'm going to just fake a little cadenza.
I was operated on three weeks ago, and I, uh, I had, as I say, a cancerous condition that I've been treated for, plus a heart attack, and so I haven't been playing too much lately. <laughs> but uh, there should be something coming out. <laughs> It's rather interesting. I started lying out as a bugler, and um, every now and then I still revert back to them. <laughs> In the development of the high range, when I was practicing, I started Wednesday, I went back to just playing taps and a lot of bugle calls up there. In other words, I was retracing steps that I did when I was young. And it worked beautifully. The high notes are coming back. The, uh, it's becoming very functional now. I'll rejoin the Chicago Symphony in June uh, at Ravinia Park. <laughs> Sent up. I didn't know what I was using, but I have to look this over. It's very good. <laughs> too old to be buying new tubas all the time now, but the temptation is still there. This is a very good one. Uh, frequently in playing strange instruments and strange mouthpieces, there are handicaps. I'm handicapped right now in the sense that I'm weak. And uh, there's a certain strength factor in playing, and even if it's minimal, it still has to be there. And I can still function on the horn but I'd have to go through a period of conditioning, which will take maybe another two weeks. Then I would, you know, be a little more, what would I say, prepared. So I wanted to play down the tuba playing and play up the talking. It's much easier. <laughs>